going to have an event today uh, whose title is a Blockchains, Micropayments, and Zero Knowledge Proof. Um, I think uh, probably most of you, maybe not all, know the model of the Simons Institute where we have programs that are dedicated to special topics in computer science plus sometimes related fields where we bring together visitors from all around the world, both postdocs and senior researchers to collaborate on these topics. And uh, today is really dedicated all to cryptography in one form or another. And um, you know, both uh, I and the first speaker, or maybe I should say the first speaker and I, uh, were students and gr graduate students at Berkeley. Uh, and we actually did um, both gr uh, PhDs on uh, cryptography. So in some sense, a lot of uh, things that you'll see today, um, I think, have origin actually in those early days in Berkeley. So it's sort of nice to have this full circle, although it doesn't end. We continue, right? Silvio. Yes. <laughs> OK. He's not paying any attention. OK. So, uh, so, uh, so we have a full agenda today, as you saw. And um, we have, have two long breaks. One is lunch, and then there's also reception. Uh, but you know, altogether, everybody in this field is a little flexible. So if you want to cut a few minutes over, a few minutes under, it's all good. For example, I'm going to be definitely under in my talk, because by then, I think people are going to be quite tired. Uh, and here, there are supposed to be researchers, scientists, industry, academia, entrepreneurs, lots of students from blockchain at Berkeley. Who's here a student from blockchain at Berkeley? So, far. so this is a very active in, uh, group in Berkeley that is of undergraduates, right, that have sort of taken on the whole idea of blockchains quite early on, and they are really the spirit of entrepreneurship. Uh, and graduate students. And graduate students, yeah. okay. I don't want to insult anyone. Okay, so, and finally, I would very much I would like to thank our sponsors, Protocol Labs and Kedit. So I think there are representatives here from both places uh, who have helped us put this uh, uh, event together. So I hope you enjoy the day. I think there's a list of really great speakers. I mean, we paid attention to <laughs> who's sp speaking. And uh, it is recorded, and hopefully we will get permission to post it later, but we haven't sort of prepared for that in advance. So with that, I will invite the oh, one and only Silvio Mikali who, uh, to start off. And as I said, Silvio was a graduate student at Berkeley uh, in the early 1980s. And then he went on to University of Toronto and then to MIT, where he's been ever since. Now he's in Algorand. He's a founder of this Algorand uh, uh, company, LLC. Yes. Uh, and in any case, Silvio is, is really fantastic. He's one of the most creative uh, people that I have ever met, and I would say that he deserves the title a genius in any form. Oops. By any thing, <laughs> any standard that you you can um, well. you can think of, he, he really never ceases to amaze me the way he sort of embarks on a new <coughs> enterprise, research-wise, with impact in the world, and uh, such gutso is uh, kind of. I'm awestruck. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you very much, Shafi. Great uh, pleasure to be back in, in uh, Berkeley at the Simons. And uh, thank you for organizing this um, special day. You guys have uh, really a lot of uh, technology to stay, stay, stay put, stay calm, stay hydrated. <laughs> There's a lot of going on. So I want to tell you about Algorand. By the way, let me claim uh, right away something that is, uh, is uh, an alternative blockchain. It's a little bit different from, uh, from the others and has been uh, developed for uh, first principles. Sometimes it's uh, easier to start from scratch than try to patch uh, whatever already exists. And uh, enable continuous progress. What does this mean? Who knows? But uh, uh, if, you, if I don't answer that question, you should bring it up because uh, I think it is a particular part uh, of the Technolo uh, of the technology to, uh, some technology is needed to guarantee this. So here is the blockchain promise, right? It's a great promise. Who doesn't like an uncorruptible database? Who doesn't like transparency? Who doesn't like generating trust from the middle of nowhere and enabling people who barely know each other to transact with, uh, 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 with, with uh, great trust? Everybody. So the application and the use cases of uh, blockchains are unlimited. However, there is a very much an open secret. Blockchains do not exist. In fact, blockchains are very much aspirational. Okay? And um, there has not been a technology to, to support them. <coughs> and by the way, it is a very good idea to really raise the bar of our aspirations as humans. Right? That's our fate. 
to, to want more and more and more. But at some point, if the technology doesn't support our aspiration, it will remain a pie in the sky. So, is this me I say it? Now, you know, the famous blockchain trilemma, just to show how aspirations are, is due to Vitalik Buterin, who is really the founder of Ethereum. He's a very famous blockchain. And he famously said, you know, if you want a blockchain, you can enjoy at the most two of the following three properties. Decentralization, security, scalability. Really? So let me explain what does it mean. Blockchain by design, welcome. So what do you want? A blockchain, excellent. Which property do you want to omit from your blockchain? Security, great choice. <laughs> Who wants to omit security? Nobody. Perhaps you want to de uh, omit a decentralization. Well, what do you want a blockchain? <laughs> All right, so how about scalability? You want a blockchain for friends and family? What are you trying to do? So these are, uh, there is uh, no, it, this trilemma is not acceptable. It's like if I tell you, do you want to be shot on the left knee or on the right knee? <laughs> there are no good choices in the trilemma, okay? And uh, it's not acceptable, and never mind this, it's actually false, okay? So let me tell you what the truth is. The truth is that blockchains are technical constructs and they required a lot of technology. You can get there, but you're going to get a lot of technology. And you shall see some uh, from us, uh, uh, blockchain oriented from me, from, from Ale, is going to be. So you need technology to realize these aspirations, period. So let me tell you what the challenge is, right? So you know what is a blockchain, I don't need to define, it's a sequence of blocks, nobody can alter the content of the block, and nobody can alter the order of the block. Perfect. That is the easy part. Because all blockchains achieve it in the same way. You take the previous block, you hash it, one way hash it, and you make this uh, 32 bytes a part of the next block. <coughs> Done! You achieve all these tamper proofness, tamper order, tamper everything. What is the challenge? The challenge is rather different. It's choosing the next block, right? Because if I choose it, you say, well, no thanks, right? So how the hell we choose the next block? And by the way, there is actually some very popular approaches, you know, let's go through it uh, briefly. Proof of work, by the way, why do you have to choose, remember the block. So we are, this, we, want, uh, we don't want to centralize anything. So if I want to transact, I take my transaction, which I assume is valid, I'm going to pay, I have enough money to pay, and I propagate it, I send it to 10 people who send it to, each one we send to 10 people, and we make sure that we don't repeat whatever we send, so we finish, okay? At any point in time, you may see these thousand transactions that look valid to you. Somebody else in Thailand sees these thousand transactions. Of course, he or she sees this, most of the things you see, but you know, there is a, a propagation delay, they are not coinciding. And that's a lot of a difference because if this has happened or this has happened, particularly if you continue to do so, it makes a lot of difference. So to you, you think this is the block, somebody else thinks this is the block, somebody else thinks this and this is the block. Who has the right to append the block? So Nakamoto, he, she, or they, had this actually brilliant idea. Had to say, you know what? It's called proof of work. We make a very hard, complex cryptographic riddle. And the first one who solves it has the right to append the block. Okay? So, okay, now that is clarified. Here is a solution, here is a block, I append the block, that's the next block in the chain. What is the problem of this? First of all, beta, this consumes a lot, it's very expensive, it consumes a lot of energy, hits the planet, right? So there are racks and racks and racks of, of computers trying to solve all these, uh, these computational riddles. And, uh, and this is bad because it's very expensive. So right now, uh, this cost is subsidized by, uh, by minting new Bitcoin to give uh, to the people uh, who solve the block. But once the subsidy sub uh, subsides, they go away, you have to pay for it. And who pays for it? Well, people want to put in, insert the transaction in the block. So it goes between 50, 20 and 50 bucks per transaction. So that is not exactly a way to buy a pizza, right? So it's very expensive. And second of all, it's very slow. It takes 10 minutes a block. This is why? Because necessarily so, right? Because is 
is a, the system is designed so that no matter how many people participate, you find one solution every 10 minutes. Why? Because whenever you find two solutions a few seconds of each other, one here and one in Italy somewhere, so far to solution, then you have a fork. Because you have two legitimate blocks, people who have a legitimate right to append the block. And then the one there is a fork, one of those branches dies, and if your payment is one of these branches, you can feel secure because you don't know what happens. So if you budget for one solution every 10 minutes, you occasionally have a fork, but the system can cope with it. Because, but if you say, hey, how about we produce a block every minute by making the riddle easier? Well, if you budget for a solution every minute, now the possibility that uh, we are going to have two solutions a few seconds of each other it goes much higher and you are going to have essentially a fork of a fork of a fork, a spaghetti mess where you don't even see where the hell is the longest chain, okay? That's the right. So, by the way, I understand expensive and fast. Expensive and slow is a hard sale, okay? But nonetheless, there are buyers, okay? That's good. The other point is, it's also centralized. To the point that this decentralized blockchain are coming. Why? Because once you see this racks and racks of computers, just as Google it for image, how many people can you afford it? If I try to mine Bitcoin with my laptop, in expectation, I lose money. Why? Because I'm paying for electricity right now. Simons is paying, thank you very much, Shafi. But otherwise, you know, a little bit of trigger, I pay in my pocket. But the probability that I solve the riddle is so small that in expectation I lose money. The only way to hope to be profitable or breaking even is to have such a big hardware investment that very few people can actually do it. Bottom line, right now Bitcoin is controlled by free mining pools. Okay, all abroad by the way, where energy is cheaper. And by the way, why it's cheaper? Because usually they, they corrupt a local official who sell them you know, uh, for cheap, okay? That's how it works. So, is free decentralized? Are you kidding me? Free is completely centralized, right? They are f much more large banks <laughs> than the free mining pools, okay? So, that is, um, is really is bizarre. All this uh, notion of it, uh, decentralization is coming, uh, journalists talk about uh, philosophers, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, nothing is coming. Nothing is decentralized yet, okay? Period. All right, next idea. Delegated proof of stake. It's a simple idea. Essentially means, you see those 21 people over there? They look so honest. Let's put them in charge to choose the next block on behalf of all of us. Isn't that easy? Yes, it is. But is this decentralized? No, it's centralized from the get-go. But those people are honest. Well, you know, people lose interest in being honest over time. But independent of that, you can actually attack them once it is anything, you have a fixed uh, group of people, by denial of service attack. You know those bots that generate junk messages and you throw it against one person, 21 people, in fact a thousand people if you want, so their buffers are full of junk, they cannot see anything anymore, they have a buffer overflow. What was their job? Oh, scouting around for legitimate transaction to put in the next block. They can't see anything. So the blockchain grinds to a halt and you know what the price is of the line of service attack? Five minutes, five dollars. So choose somebody you hate and you want to put them up for five dollars, $5, done. 21 people, bad idea, okay? All right, next, bonded proof of stake. That's another simple idea. You say, oh, bonded proof of stake, uh, whatever it's called. Delegated, bad, bonded, good. So let me tell you what the bonded is. Let's summarize for you. Bonded means that we allow not just 20 people to use the block. We allow 20 people, 200 people, 2,000 people, as many as they want to people to put some money in the middle of the table where they cannot touch it. And the people who put the money in the middle of the table are the ones in charge of selecting the block on behalf of all of us. And their influence in so selecting the block is proportional to the amount of money they put in the table. And if they misbehave, their money is confiscated. Wow! That has to be the solution, right? Well, let's pause that one. Let me ask a much simpler question. How much of your disposable income can you afford to put in the middle of a table 
where he's not invested, not in stocks, not in bond, but he's hostage? <coughs> the answer is very little. For some. So what happens in a system like this, you, may, you actually roll a big red carpet for big thieves with deep pockets to put a disproportionate amount of money in the middle of the table for the sole purpose of controlling the blockchain. This is a controversial point I'd like to devote a few uh, more seconds, but first I want to continue with my, 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 uh, my thing because uh, there is no, first of all, the notion also that money can be confiscated is a fantasy because there is a lot of, there, is, there is certainly bad people, but there is much fewer bad and stupid people. So in order to have my money confiscated, I must do something overtly public that allows somebody to confiscate my money. There is plenty of bad things that I can do. So for instance, if John and I want to transact, and I don't want to transact, assume that there is an auction done on chain, and uh, I don't want my competitors to put their bids, right? I bribe whoever uh, is uh, over there and says, don't, uh, don't put those bids. And what do you say? How come they their money? They didn't put their bids. I didn't see your bid. How the hell are you going to prove and confiscate their money? That is a fantasy, OK? Forget the Spanishing people. Uh, it, 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 it very rarely works, if ever. So the point is, in all these things, let me tell you what the logic, questionable <laughs> logic, the systems have. And it's, the logic goes as this. The whole economy works if the majority, if the small piece of economy is, is, uh, are honest. And he says, sorry, what type of logic is this? Indeed, I don't see the logic either. So how can it be that you take the whole economy at the mercy of a small piece of it? Who is the small piece of it? Over here are these free money pools. Over here are the 21 delegates. And over here are the people who put money in the middle of the thing. But can there be a big piece of economy? No, there is no relation between the money on the table and the value of the economy elsewhere, right? So assume that you even have a bank, OK? We are going to have a bank on the blockchain, too. Where is the money of a bank? Loaned. It's not in the middle of a table. So I can be a huge financial institution, right, who has a tremendous amount of holdings, but, but they're not in the middle of a table. So in the middle of a table is a position of danger, and very few people are unproductively hostage. Just imagine that most of the money is unproductively chosen in the middle of the table. The economy goes nowhere, OK? That is a bit of the, the problem. So what do we have in mind? We have in mind something else, which we call it pure proof of stake. Let me tell you intuitively what it is, and realizing it is all the secret sauce, that you need the math, finally. You need the algorithm, finally. You need the, uh, economics uh, plans, finally. So first of all, no punishments. Everybody loves punishment, right? So if you steal, I'll cut off your hands. <laughs> That's good. Ah, makes me feel better. But you know, it rarely works. In fact, it has never worked. Okay, people have stolen all the time, no matter if you put upside down, hung by their thumbs or whatever. So much better idea is to make sure that cheating is impossible. Okay. Second part is where is your money? Is where it should be at your fingertips in your wallet, invested in the various financial tools that blockchain offer to you. And when you take in consideration all of this money, productively used or productively ignored, <laughs> unproductively ignored, if the majority of the money is honest hands, the system works. So this is the first time in which you're going to have the economy works if the majority of the economists want it to work. But could the majority of the economy think of economy? Yes, they could, <laughs> but somehow it's not exactly for them very rational. Different is to say, if a minority controls it, to say, but when they think of economy, they think themselves. Sure, but if it's a small piece, let me give you something. Let me say, how much do you have here invested in this economy? A million? Ah, let's make it two million in cash by a different economy, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Fiat currency. And you say, you know, sink your assets, and you do it. If you do it for the majority, it's a totally different story, OK? So that is the idea behind the pure proof of stake. And uh, by the way, so now to start a little bit about technology. What is the idea about Algorand? The idea of Algorand is that we want to choose the next block. How about 
we agree, we reach consensus on the next block. And when I thought about doing this, I was saying, this is ludicrous. Um, you know, Mikali, so usually Silvio from my friends, but Mikali is wrong and would be proven wrong because this would never work, okay? Not quite. First of all, let me tell you what the Byzantine agreement is. It's actually very strong technology developed in the 80s, and is a communication protocol, say, among the people in this room, think of it, such a way that we could talk and talk, and if the majority of the participants are honest, two things, properties are guaranteed. Agreement. No matter what values we can start with in our mind, at the end of the conversation, all honest people agree on the same value. You can see who is honest and dishonest by easily. Okay, second property, consistency. Just in case everybody starts with the same value, then all honest people, not alone, not let alone, will, they will agree on a common value, but they agree on the very value in which they start. By the way, achieving this is easy without this. Why? Because you say, here is a Byzantine agreement that takes one step. No matter what the value is, output zero. Yes, ma'am. Agree. Or every honest follows the rules, we agree on zero. But the point is that if you start at 127, you should agree on 127. If it just is the case that everybody starts with 33, you should agree on 33. Yet to think about it, we don't have any time, but we have three seconds to absorb it. One, two, three. What a great protocol, okay? What is the relation? What are these damn values? You know what these damn values are? Are what in your mind, and your mind, and my mind, the next block is going to be, okay? So we want to agree on, uh, on a common block, possibly the empty block uh, sometimes, but it's important to keep us together, and that's what's the idea. All right, hey! This is 1980 technology. There are Byzantine agreement protocol. There is a plug, a plug it in, done. Well, not so fast. This is abysmally slow, Byzantine agreement. You know what people look to it to keep this consistent and keep everything in agreement? Three players. The highest number of players ever conceived in a practical Byzantine agreement was 12, highest. So now we want to do, you know, you know, between the billions of people, that's a little bit, uh, we need uh, a, a different Byzantine agreement protocol. And moreover, it's predicated on the fact that the number of players are fixed and known in advance. Over the internet, in a permissionless blockchain where everybody's going to, who knows what is in it right now, and who knows you know, how many more people are going to come in. Nothing is fixed, right? So not only is very slow and you have all these challenges, but no mistake about it. So the secret source of the consensus mechanism in Algorand is really delivering Byzantine agreement on a planetary scale with unparalleled efficiency, period. Why I say Byzantine agreement? Because what sometimes when people cannot deliver a Byzantine agreement, they deliver it ex Byzantine agreement. For instance, practical Byzantine agreement. You say, oh, practical Byzantine agreement is a Byzantine agreement, it's practical. No, Byzantine agreement is something. Practical Byzantine agreement is something else. Could be a tortoise, a different object, okay? Completely different. And, uh, but because you are, the mind is stuck on Byzantine agreement, you think it is what it is and modifies, the adjective modifies the noun. Nah, it, it takes a whole different meaning altogether. This actually is Byzantine agreement like Peace, Short, and Lamport defined for us. All right. So let me tell you what, this, what, agree, what does it mean that to agree on a block one by one, and let's see in action. Okay, here is block number one. By the way, block number one, so-called the genesis block in every blockchain, you don't need to agree on anything, because it's agreed by definition. It's part of the very specification of the protocol, okay? One block we have no problem <laughs> agreeing is the genesis block, B1. Next to it, there is a favor, a I would say, universal symbol of lightness and effortlessness. And as this favor effortlessly falls down, the chain starts unfolding, okay? That's the way it works. And now you have a chain. You say, Silvio, didn't you make it a little bit too easy? Where are the forks? Where is the proof of work with favor business? Well, there are no forks. 
Why? Because we agree on every single block. So there is not a, a statistical process that may actually sometimes uh, fork. So we, there is no forks. And uh, there is no proof of work. There is, the work is a bit of agreeing, but as I said, it's very fast to work because it's a super fast Byzantine agreement. So if you leave it at this stage, and I want to leave it at this stage for now, here are the differences. The first one is transaction finality. So once you see a block, you can rely on it right away. You don't have to wait or fear that there is going to be another branch that is going to overcome and close this, this branch to, to die. So you can rely on it right away, which is an important thing in a financial uh, environment. There is enough risk as there is. The last risk you want, if you do a wire transfer, say with some probability, the money, vani the money vanishes. Now, you know, the whole economy will start to grind into halt under this situation. And what does this mean? This is really easy participation. You and I, with a laptop, nonetheless, you can actually participate because the work is required is very, very easy. So can I ask a question? So when you said the proof of bond, I understood that you have to put money in the middle. And in yeah. your case, you don't have to put money in the middle. Everybody can participate. But it yeah. is proportional to how much, they, how much money they have. Yes, we should because you want. But the only people who can sink the economy is the majority of the economy. So you really have to, fig to figure out that your influence and your invested interest, the more money you have, the more invested interest you have, that the economy works. And who can sink in, in algo under the economy? The majority of the money. It cannot be, but it's a but minority. If the money is held by Google. Then they don't, don't want to sink it. OK, so that's a kind of an economic rationale why this is the right model. Right. So you have to remember that you know, sinking is so you want to have all kinds of property that do not disappear. So in other words, you want to say, you want to make sure that nobody censors you. As long as you know, there is a good old fashioned 10% of it, they're honest, they don't want to, hey, nobody censors you. The other thing is to say, I want this blockchain to grant to halt. And now the interests are aligned because you need for this, right? Because that is the, the other danger. But you, have, you find you know, very few levers who control very little of the economy, Destroying the economy, they're destroying whatever they own in the economy. But so what? Okay. I can write that conference. Yes, yes. I'm very severe. Um, just another question quickly. So, oh, you don't take questions? No, I, know, I do take questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry. In terms of uh, Byzantine agreement at a planetary scale, yes. So, you know, this condition that everybody, you know, it's, it's only when everybody has the same value that you must output the same value. So, isn't wouldn't the following algorithm work with, except for you know, a tiny probability, you know, uh, almost vanishingly small, which is always output zero? And now, in the exceptional case where the, there are these billion people, who I think I said this. You must have been distracted. Yeah. I'm saying. So I've said that if you want Byzantine agreement, it means to have agreement and consistency. And if yeah. you care about agreement without consistency, you can always output zero. No, no, I know. Okay. So then this, uh, this is that is not true. I'll tell you one thing. If uh, questions are um, at any time, this question is a bit easier when you see a bit general architecture. Okay. All right. But not now. But not now. It's, you can ask any time, but not now. <laughs> All right. So let me tell you a summary, right? So the main assumption is this honest majority of money, right? By the way, this wins over any time over honest majority of computing power, which is whatever happens in proof of work. Why? Because money is fungible. So if uh, somebody has more money, then he can buy certainly more computing power, and then he can have more uh, majority of computing power. So that is as slow as you can go, in my opinion. And, but here is the main uh, technical advantages. The one technical advantage is that the computation involved is trivial. A few addition, a few comparison, signing a message, verifying a digital signature, nothing to write home about. Everybody could do it. To decentralization, you don't have users and miners, right? Users and delegates, users and uh, money in the table guys. You have one class of users, all the people who have the money, no exogenous power. Finality of payments, you say there are no forks. Well, I lied. There is a probability of forking, which is 10 to the minus 18. 10 to the minus 18, that is a very strange number. Of course it's strange, because I made it up. But let me tell you why I, I, I made it up. Because 10 to 18 happens to be the number 
of seconds from the Big Bang until now in the universe. So another way to do it, to say it, is that if you can produce a block a second, which is pretty good clip, it's going to take, you may see a fork, but you have to wait for the age of the universe to see it. You know, at this point, this you know. Under an assumption. What? This is under some sort of cryptographic assumption. Under some cryptographic assumption. Your digital signatures are good. Yes, 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 yes. But this, uh, this uh, the age of the universe is uh, irrelevant for. Uh, I thought it had something to do with breaking. No, no, no. I, I, break, I mean, <laughs> to break the crypto, <laughs> you have to wait more than the age of the universe, as you know, right? Because uh, there are uh, so many seconds, so many, any art, so many elementary particles. Each one is a supercomputer. You know, if uh, if you have uh, uh, good cryptography, this is is not going to be relevant. When a system fails, it's not because you f you fail the hashing of the thing. You fail by some other structure, right? Okay, so then the scalability, well, this scales as, as much as you can. Why? In the sense that you can generate blocks as fast as you can propagate them. In some sense, you cannot generate faster if you want to have a, a, a decentralized system. Why? Because you need to know what the previous block is before being, uh, validating whether the transaction this block are valid or not. In other systems, say Bitcoin, for instance, you have artificial delays, never mind how fast the network is, but you must make 10 minutes, why? To avoid too many forks, right? So that is, there is no other bottleneck here. And so finally, there is security against a bad adversary. How bad? Very bad. So what does that mean? That means the following, that even if an adversary can corrupt any player, uh, up to say a third of the players, and I can, perfectly control and coordinate all the bad player and can attack both the protocol and the network. Algorand is secure because, as Shafi says, the crypto is secure, okay? So it's not, are, all the rest of infrastructure fades in the background. The only point is that can you forge a signature, yes or no? If you can't, there is nothing you can do. By the way, all the, when talking about the security, most of the time we talk about attacking the protocol, but the protocol is run on a communication network. So why should the adversary attack only the protocol rather than the communication network? How can I attack the communication network? I don't know. You can cut wires. You can uh, reconfigure routers. You can do all kinds of things. And you know, under this type of attacks, you know, Bitcoin completely collapses, even if all miners are honest. Okay, easy, easy. So, but, uh, so, but not uh, not uh, not algo. And it's secure in both sense. And by the way, should we be so adversarial? Yes, because a decentralized economy is really should be worth a trillion dollars, okay? Easy. So when you have uh, targets of this value, bad actors are going to spring up from the middle of nowhere like mushrooms after the rain. So you must really be prepared. And don't say, oh, we're going to be a chivalrous adversary that attacks the protocol on the network. They can attack anything that moves. Okay, so now tell me a little bit how the architecture of Algorand works, and they uh, answer it in some sense, uh, hopefully, uh, your question, Umesh. So Algorand works in two magic phases. Parenthesis, the magic is actually replaced by mathematics, but uh, never mind. It's easier to talk about magic, do you agree? So, phase one is the proposal phase. Here how it works. A random token is selected, assume there are 10 billion tokens in circulation, is randomly selected. How? By magic. That's the magic phase, right? So this token is selected. Then this token must belong to some public key. This public key, by magic, is clear. Say, oh, that's the public key of Shafi. OK. And what the, the public key of Shafi belongs to Shafi. And Shafi proposes a block, digitally signed, and so on. So in this magic phase, you see a block signed by Shafi. You know that Shafi as a the owner of the token randomly selected, that's the block that, that Shafi has proposed. Phase two, a thousand tokens are randomly selected, again by magic, their keys becomes pu publicly known by magic, and what do they do with people, these are thousand people? They reach a Byzantine agreement on the block proposed by Shafi. The maximum was 12, now there is a 1,000, but if it is true that the Byzantine agreement is very fast, we, we can certainly do that, okay? Okay, why do we want 
this second phase. Because in any society, and a blockchain is no exception, there is a percentage of bad actors, okay? Criminals, 1%, 2%. If you live in a very dangerous society, 10%. I want to ruin myself. You live in a society where 20% are bad actors. You should not leave the house. You should do other things, okay? But even so, there will never be a majority the bad actors. Because what is a society? It's a group of people which exist in so far, the majority of which follow certain rules. If nobody follows the rules, there is no society, period. Okay? So let's assume we live in a dangerous society. 10% of, of, of us are criminals. So if you select things like this, 10% of the time, you're going to get a bad actor. And what can a bad actor proposing a block do? Simple. It can tell you the block is X, can tell somebody else the block is Y, can tell somebody else the block is Z, putting in this scored the chain, the thought to be linear. So that's why we have a second phase, because no matter what value you start with from the proposer, you end up in a single block. If the proposer is honest, you are forced to agree on the block. If it's not, it's not honest, you, uh, you agree on a block of valid transaction anyway. And why? Solve the problem in the sense that there is, but, but who says that this is a fair block among all blocks? Nobody yet. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> I'm glad because uh, Shaf is an advisor on the project, and half, after this, she will know how the project works. That is good. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, 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 <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, so, so you see, for the is there, if there is, a, say, a 90% honest majority, can it be that you select some a thousand things, people are random, and you have a dishonest majority? No, that is really probability theory. You compute the probability, probability is very, very small. So that's what, what happens. So when, uh, so whenever these guys are going to agree on some block that contains invalid transaction, and they never, uh, but when they agree, they agree on the same block. And now, to show this problem, to say, if somebody is uh, dishonest, what can it be? That maybe can censor uh, Ali, want to put a transaction, you don't put it Ali's transaction. But what, what is going to happen? N next phase starts immediately after. So some random token is selected, whoever it belongs to select. If this guy is honest, he puts all honest, uh, all his transaction he sees in the block. He doesn't exclude anybody. So at most, you have a little bit of a delay, right? That is the idea. A couple of questions. One is, should I be online all the time? If this is randomly selected, my computer should be running all the time? Yes and no. So let me explain. <laughs> but the answer you should think is yes and, and it is easy. So let me actually to do something a bit more sophisticated that is going to take you know, tons of, uh, of, uh, of analysis put in the background. Let me ask you a different, a different question. How many times do you switch off Gmail to save electricity? On my laptop or? Yeah. Whenever my laptop is off, like, I mean. Exactly, the only when my laptop is off. So you don't assume a waiver that I pay you to, make, to keep it on. Would you switch it off? No. So the, that is the idea. So the idea is that if you reduce the participation cost to essentially nothing, and on top of it, by the way, by participating, you actually gain uh, a lot, then you don't take it off. But in any case, so um, to have a more sophisticated answer, we allow to have also online and offline participation, but, uh, but it's important that you declare whether you are on or offline, honestly, at the beginning, okay? But it's a bit more sophisticated. I, let I'm me asking, shouldn't one make a quantified analysis versus proof of oh, Absolutely. You want a quantified analysis of everything, right? So, but, you know, I have an hour, of which half an hour is gone, and uh, right then, yeah. But, Samir, the answer to Shafi's previous question, the 10 to the minus 18 is related to the uh, probability of sampling these thousands such that the majority... Yes, is yes, the yes, right? yes, yes. No, 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 the crypto. the crypto works, okay? Or, or if it doesn't work, uh, we can disband ourselves. <laughs> a lot of things have happened. And, uh, but uh, yes, that is something to do overall the, the rest of the structure of the protocol. So we have a probability epsilon of breaking the crypto and a probability, say, alpha of doing anything else. And this uh, alpha plus epsilon is, uh, is less than 10 to minus 18. The, the probability of sampling a thousand yes. such that they are online 
Yeah. That is one element. There is also other elements in the analysis. That is just one element. Yes, darling. All right. Okay. It's clear somehow how it works. Okay. So, okay. But the highlight level, how it works. Okay. By the way, it says, thank you, Silvio, for your uh, very high level in, uh, explanation. I have uh, one question. One question? You should have uh, thousands of questions, right? So let's actually analyze three because that's what we have time for. And, um, and by the way, in this analysis, we're going to do something weird. And you should expect something weird to happen. Because if we don't start extracting rabbits out of a hat, we are going to fall into the pitfalls of Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera. So the first and most popular question is the following. If I understood something, the whole power of all this business is based on selecting the committee. Right? So how sh who should select the committee? Right? The committee is selected so that they can agree on the block. But who select the committee? Let's assume that I tell you I do. Boo, -hoo, this is the most centralized system, and you are at the center of it. Good. Let's assume that I said, well, humanity debates to select a committee, and when the committee agrees on the block, we all die before we agree on anything, let alone on a fast and strong committee. So here is what we do with something a bit unorthodox, in which is the committee members select themselves. What? That is a terrible idea. In fact, it's actually maybe the second worst idea I ever proposed, because if I am a bad actor, of course I self-select myself to approve this block, and I self-select myself to approve the next block, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But not so fast, because in order to self-select, what you had to do is that you had to run your own individual lottery. And the lottery is cryptographically fair, so unless you break a crypto, you essentially, even if you are a national state with huge, major, uh, 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 huge computational resources, you cannot enhance the probability of being selected, period. Okay. And uh, if you win, you actually get a winning ticket, a proof that you won and you are part of this committee. And if you don't win, you can talk, but you're not taken seriously about approving of this block because uh, you, you are nobody. You, your opinion doesn't count this time. Okay? So when I say a lottery, think about it that you use a slot machine. In, inside your computer, each one of us pulls the lever and see if he wins. If he wins, you have a winning ticket. If you don't, you don't, you don't have it. And if you have a winning ticket, what do you do? You propagate your winning ticket and your opinion up and down or about the block proposed by Shafi, right? <coughs> that's a, that's a way, uh, the way it works. Otherwise, you shout, don't listen to Shafi, but it doesn't matter. You are not a winning ticket. You can say anything you want. That's his idea, OK? But also in the first phase, this is the case? In the, also in the first phase, good question. But, but technically, the first phase is harder than the second phase, and that's why I'm, all, <laughs> I'm focusing my attention on the latter phase, okay? It's a good uh, catch. Remember, there are magic phase one, magic phase two. I decided to talk about magic phase two. It's a bit easier. All right, okay? By the way, this slot machine, uh, is n you only have one shot at the slot machine. It's not that say, oh, let me pull. Oh, I don't win. Let me pull the lever again. Uh -uh you get the same result than before. So it's essentially is a single-use single <laughs> slot machine lever, OK? That's what you have. OK, so now let me argue that this is really super decentralized. Can I assume that the slot machine depends on the state of the uh, block right now, uh, the chain right now? <coughs> yes. And, uh, and that is actually perhaps the highest technical challenge of you algorithm. can't engineer your own slot machine to work in your favor because you don't know yes. what the state of the yes. training Because mm -hmm. essentially, any time you want to have use crypto, guess what? You must have inputs. Where do you find the inputs in a blockchain? Well, in the blockchain itself. Oh, but the blockchain itself, what do we record in the blockchain? The blocks we ourselves create, the transaction we ourselves create. So if I'm an adversary, I'm going to tweak the blockchain so as to get a good input that allows my slot machine to win. To prove that there is some quantity that <coughs> is untamperable enough, even though an adversary can choose the content of the block, that's the heart of the matter. Thank you for bringing it up. Sorry that you brought it up, because it's a distraction, OK? <laughs> so, so because many things get complicated. But at a high level, that's what happens, OK? Now, let me argue that this is super decentralized. 
Of course it's the decentralized, because we don't have a thousand fixed people who are in charge of this. It's best time with 1,000 people in Valorant. This other type, of this uh, other guy, two in Australia, one in Malaysia, three in France, right? So, yeah. Next time somebody else. So it, it, it is decentralized because it's a really a random lottery. And let me tell you that this is super scalable because what do you have to do? How much does it take to pull the lever? One microsecond. That's pretty fast. And by the way, it's not you first pull the lever one microsecond, then you pull the lever, that's adds up. But essentially, it's <laughs> think of it that in the same microsecond, <laughs> everybody pulls the lever. I mean, the second, three microseconds because this is not synchronized uh, network, right? But think of it, it all of these uh, people pull the lever more or less you know, around the same time, and, uh, and therefore this is super scalable. And what you do when you send you know, your opinion about the block, that is, super, that, that is fast. It's a short message. So now let me argue that it's super secure. Well, assume that I'm the big scary guy that I was telling you about. And we already argue that the power is in the committee. I have as magic power of corrupting anybody I want. Whom should I corrupt? The committee. But I have a problem. I don't know who the committee is. Should I corrupt you and you and you, or this lady in the street, this other guy in Spain? I don't know. I don't know until the committee reveals itself by propagating the winning ticket and their opinion about the block. At that point, I know who they are, and I can attack them. But wait a minute. At that point, attacking them gives me no more be benefit. Why? Because the winning ticket and their opinion about the block is virally being propagated over the network and will continue to be <laughs> whether I attack them or not. I don't have the power to put back these messages in the bottle no more than the US government has the power to put back in the bottle a message virally propagated by Wikileaks. So the system is secure because ex ante, I don't know whom I corrupt, and ex post is too late to corrupt it. Roughly. So if you put this, that gives you the beginning of analysis of why the trilemma can actually work, okay? It's not a full analysis, there are more parts to, to, this, to the system, but you start getting, if you do things weird enough, all these assumptions somehow collapse. The fact that 2,000 blockchains uh, enjoy two out of three property doesn't mean that all of them should do it. It's better than the Trinity that we discussed yesterday. <laughs> yes, philosophy and uh, thing. So, by the way, wait a second. These uh, are Byzantine agreement very slow? Well, they are, but not the one we use. We design from scratch a new one, which is actually super fast, because it takes a handful of steps, and every step Everybody has to propagate a single short and easy to compute message. That is good. Then there is a bit more sophisticated, 10 minutes remaining, very good. <laughs> Which means, uh, you know, when I did the analysis, you know, that's why I wear a jacket when I give this talk, because I hide the, as many details for as long as I can. And you guys are forcing me to get in on technical also. Good. You see, why did it convince you that it was secure? Because I had to propagate one, one winning ticket and one opinion about the block. But what I'm saying here, that I could do, run the Byzantine agreement. So I can, if I tell you I'm part of this Byzantine agreement, and then I tell you in the same sentence, and this only takes a few steps. Oh, a few steps. So when I send you the proof that I am entitled to speak in this Byzantine agreement, and my first message, you cannot stop him for the reason that I just gave you. Not before and not after. But if the same person speaks a second time or a third time, now once you know what you are, if you have this magical power with immediate corruption, you can corrupt them then and control the second and third message, and who knows where that gets you. So the point here is because convening a committee in Algorand is so, takes so this easy, so it's this, this microsecond. You can afford to have independent committee for each step of the Byzantine Agreement protocol. And, uh, and essentially, that is a new property. And by the way, that is uh, one of the best uh, audiences of cryptographers ever assembled. 
you know that this is a new property because you know we thought we never thought about defining it so bizarre it is because let me tell you it's very easy to say different steps different people but what type of an intelligent conversation can you have when each step of a conversation is a different type of random selected people who don't know each other right so to have a protocol that is so robust that continues to deliver meaningful properties like agreement and consistency, even though different people talk at the same time and you don't even know who they are, that's hard. It is a unique, I was really, I remember I woke up and my wife says, the Byzantine agreement protocol is <laughs> player replaceable. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, I was uh, so excited, you know, I wasn't sleeping. And uh, so, so here means these are, there is going to be step one is a green committee, step two is a, is a red committee and so on and so forth, right? So let's see, what is the relationship between these members of these committee members? None, okay, because they are randomly selected. Occasionally, you can happen that, you know, maybe <coughs> this guy is equal to this guy, but, you know, uh, it could happen also not. That is, there is no relationship. They are different players. And by the way, there are also different numbers. Right, because uh, <laughs> it's a lottery. So sometimes, you know, you have a thousand, but you actually have 1,100, and other times you have 150. So you cannot even match them up. Uh, whatever uh, Jonathan says corresponds to it. No, there is not such a thing. And they have no shared variable because they don't know who else is going to be selected. And yet, they act as if it is a single committee from beginning to end, okay? And this, ladies and gentlemen, is to be truly distributed in the presence of a bad and powerful adversary. Because if you tell me, like many projects have, oh, we have a committee, but we keep in, in charge for an hour. We keep in charge for 10 minutes. Even in 10 minutes, I cannot corrupt in the good old fashioned way. Knock, knock. You don't know me, I'm a friend of yours. Here is my bag of money to prove it. That takes time, right? But a denial of service attack, that takes no time. So if you put in for a day, for an hour, for uh, a minute, it's a bit too late. The only way to say is that you only speak once and therefore and corrupting doesn't matter, denial of service attack doesn't matter. That's the only way to go. And by the way, then we have a new type of a protocol. I like this because it has a logic structure that allows us to reason. The new protocol actually has agreement on the fly, has a single round of body and uh, is resilient against arbitrary uh, network partitions, but I have no time to tell you. I instead, I'd like to tell the few minutes remaining to me to tell you a little bit what happens beyond the consensus. First of all, uh, let me start a little bit with the Dutch auction, just to be, uh, they are very simple things. We did not invent them. We are going to invent all kinds, actually, of, we have invented all kinds of financial tools. This is an old tool, but is. Uh, who knows who uses Dutch auctions every day? Governments, including our own, to sell, for instance, bonds. But whom do they sell it? They sell it to Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and a few other suspects, who buy them on the cheap and then resell them to all of us at higher prices. Is this fair? Mm, not really. So on the other side, you have actually a technological problem. So you know this Dutch auction, there is a descending price, and how do you know that in the entire globe, this, everybody sees the same descending price? Uh, that is a technological uh, challenge. But I'm saying that is just a simple example of what I think the, the good outcome of this is, not only to have payments. Payments is, at the end are easy. I didn't say because they are not, but uh, they are easy, decentralized, they are not so simple, truly decentralized, not simple. But you know, Dutch auction is the other thing, because what you want to have is a, an idea of a democratization of finance, right? Which allows you to have an essentially global participation by everybody, direct global participation. I think, and you need the technology for doing that, and uh, there is technology to be had. The next thing is, um, you know what, uh, you know random access is very important. Just think of Turing machines. Nobody programs Turing machines, okay? Unless you want to do a proof. But otherwise, you know, People like to random access. So why one of the main sources of centralization is a blockchain is the damn storage required to store the chain, right? So pretty soon it'll be a terabyte. So you want to join five minutes or plenty? Five minutes, so join up. Oh, download the terabyte and then participate. 
you know, takes time. And pretty soon, and if we produce blocks faster than anybody else, nobody can store these things, or very few people can store the things. We have decentralization from another angle. So what this uh, Vault project is, essentially, is a way that you obtain a very compact information, that you can up and you update a very compact information. But so whenever you join the blockchain, you're given a compact information that allows you to go forward exactly the same way as someone who was, from the very beginning, has stored the entire chain. And, uh, and uh, you get also a proof that this compact information is correct, because otherwise I can give you some compact piece of information that is totally false. And this proof is based on what? You know what is based? On the only thing certain in a blockchain, the Genesis block. Okay, so here is a proof of Genesis based on the Genesis blocks, all you need to know, and, the, and you continue forward. So, and if I want to store the chain, why should I store it? Well, because if you want to have asked a question about a past transaction, say five, you know, blockchain don't prevent people from suing each other, right? We are in a democracy, everybody can sue anybody else. So it's say, you didn't pay. Oh, actually, yeah, Amy, I was, uh, I did pay you uh, a million algos or three years ago. And, and I need to exhibit the proof. So if I just join with a compact piece of information, I have no idea what happens three years ago. But those who store the chain can actually provide it, retrieve the block, and actually convey the block together with a proof the block is correct based on the Genesis block. And that's the way it works. And by the way, we can generate a market. So we, get, we give some incentive to people for doing forensic analysis, on certain things, to store the chain. Because otherwise, you don't need it to go forward. But you may need it for doing this. Why should I do it? Hey, because I want, or maybe because it can be actually a business deal. Then there is all kinds of atomic swaps, which means I give you something if only if I get the same. Except that ours is going to be atomic atomic swap, really atomic atomic swap, because an atomic swap are atomic just in name. There are time blocks, all kinds of things. In blockchain, without a block finality, atomicity doesn't really exist. Smart contracts are uh, a great side product of the blockchain. However, they are not really very smart, are they? So much so that you cannot have a crypto kitten and an ICO be conducted at the same time. A crypto kitten is bored. I don't know if you know about those. It's a uh, nice, cute application. I mean, they are so damn intensive that you have to do something else. But I'd like to, you need the privacy on the blockchain. You know, Ali has some great ideas of, on how to do that, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But I'd like to stop here at this self-governance. Because if you understood, and I'll wrap it up here, the algorithm consensus mechanism is actually Byzantine agreement. All these uh, proof of work was invented to make possible to agree in this diluted fashion easily. But once we get the Byzantine agreement to work easily, we can agree on anything. What do we agree upon? 99.9% .9 of the time on the next block. But we could agree on a new monetary policy, a new rule, right? a new improvement of the protocol, by the same kind of easy. And I believe that actually this self-governance, which requires not only aspirational, we want to be self-governed. Everybody wants, right? Except the dictators, they don't want you to self-govern, but otherwise. Uh, but the question is, we need technology. Because if I say, I'm against this, and I blog it three times a day, it doesn't mean I have three times more community behind me. No, it just means I blog more. I blog in capital letter, I blog, you know, bugging on the table. It doesn't mean anything. So you need to have a mechanism for doing this. And I think that right now, blockchains have been ocean liners on autopilots. They set the rules and never change them. And you set course, iceberg, no iceberg, no typhoon, no typhoon. I mean, life is about intelligent adaptation. And so the best thing that you do in life is actually have a, preserve the ability to evolve in a consensual manner. And so that I think that the agreement, the consensus with the Allah algorithm is going to be good. And that is actually the, really the way to do the borderless economy, right? So I really believe that, you know, it's a marvelous space. I think there are, uh, everybody took a very high bar. I believe it's not a winner takes all. There is going to be room for a few blockchain, but ultimately, 
if you really want to set free and to have a borderless economy, you really need technology, okay? So that is going to be even more the thing. And speaking of technology, here is an old piece of technology that actually has been built in southern France. It's an impressive piece of technology that allowed the people living uh, across the river to meet and transact with each other. And uh, it's a beautiful structure, you must admit. And also it's so strong that uh, nobody repaired for many, many, many years, thousands of years, in fact, and still stands. And until 2005, they allow cars to cross the bridge. Till we figure out, perhaps it's a bad idea, okay? <laughs> so I believe that you know, the blockchain infrastructure is going to be as useful to bridge as, as humanity to one another, and it's going to be as beautiful as any other physical infrastructure that we have built for similar purposes. And uh, in fact, if we build it correctly, we are going to be able to keep uh, the planet up, really. Uh, the planet up is an uh, atlas job, but you know, after a few years of doing so, it looks a little bit tired. So well, it's thanking for his uh, job, and we'll take it from here. Thank you very much. Both phase one and phase two seems to require randomness. Yes. So it must be, the selection process must be truly random. So I'm thinking, um, what if the source of the randomness is broken? Suppose it's a pseudo-random number generator. Uh, is there an actual risk around that? Or is it simply too fast for something like that? Both no, are? no. You should budget the risk will be done. Uh, by the way, this, in all architectural things, is very easy. If you, uh, if you really want, uh, I can uh, actually answer. Uh, of course, there is a risk. Uh, it should be well designed, but it, it's a very simple idea. It, it's much more important to get the idea, because once you say that it can be done, you can leave it an exercise to uh, bright uh, graduate students, right? Here it is. That is really the easy part. And then perhaps I take answer this question, and, and that's it. So how do we do this, right? How do we implement this lottery? The easiest way to do it, by the way, the fancy way to do it is to use, you know, verifiable random function. Forget it. Uh, I cannot even define it in, in five minutes. But this uh, has essentially all the property to give you the idea. So you have your unique signature. Think about RSA, right? So you have a not probabilistic signature, you have a unique signature. And you have an idea lash function that you can actually model as a, uh, that means that the signature of them, everybody can verify an ideal hash function. Think of it like it's a, a random a string, a, a compressor string. Uh, and then what do you do? So you want to say, uh, per, uh, per, uh, I belongs to committee R if and only if dot hash sigma QR is less than P. Sorry, I didn't understand, of course, because I didn't have time to explain it. But what is P? P is a probability, say one in a thousand. That's it, easy. And what is this QR? This is a magically determined quantity, which is something that even though is uh, depends on the blockchain, is very, very, very hard to manipulate by an adversary. So think of it as like fixed and not available to the adversary. What is this? That is the deterministic signature of I of this unique QR. Right? And what is this? That means uh, if this is independent uh, of, uh, of a, if it's a unique string, and if this is a unique signature of a unique string, this is a unique string associated to i. And uh, what is this stuff over here is a random function. So what that means, that this means is, because this is a unique string associated to i, this is a unique random string associated to i. And what is this other stuff? That is the decimal point, or the binary point, if you want, okay? so. If you, that means that all the stuff is a random number between one and zero associated to i. And so, and what is the probability that this number, random number uniquely associated to i is less than p? Is p, okay? So in other words, if you do this, i belongs to CR with probability one over a thousand. So if there is a million people, and you want to have roughly a thousand committee, you set the p equal to a thousand. And you do just that. If you have now a billion users and you want to select a thousand, you select p to be one in a million because a billion divided a million is a thousand. Isn't this easy? This is easy. 
So the only thing is, in some sense, is uh, to make sure, but the hash right? Function doesn't change. So the, fact, the hash function doesn't change. So the fact that probability controls this is because uh, this QR changes? I don't know. Yeah. QR changes. Depending on P. QR changes and, and uh, no, the QR doesn't depend no, on P. So met, you said that I can fix P to be 1 over 1,000, I can be 1 over a million. So when I fix different P, what changes in this formula? P only. QR is selected in the same way no matter what the probability the is. The, 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 the hash is the same. The hash is the same. be equal to different numbers? Because QR, yeah. uh, and, uh, what is remaining, we want to generate a block yeah. R. Yeah. And the quantity is QR. When you select, want to select block B block R plus 1, you need to have a proposer R plus 1, and you need a committee R plus 1. Mm -hmm. And the proposer and the committee are selected in the same way. No, what I'm saying is you, you were talking about different size committees, right? P has to do with the size of the committee. No, I want the same, a fa you know, well, with a thousand, it's always the same. The committees are a thousand. But because uh, the number of uh, tokens uh, can be increased uh, because we put it in circulation uh, uh, with time, so, in, uh, right, uh, by the way, how do we put the money in circulation? We don't. The, um, the Algorand Foundation do. How do they do it? By Dutch auctions. Okay? So, how does it actually act act good? So, if you work, if you want to take a bunch of identical items, like tokens are, but not only, if they work like this, they were to say, well, uh, what is a bid? A bid is, well, for a maximum of $10, I'm willing to spend a thousand dollars. So, make sure that I get, you know, a few items. However, for a maximum of five bucks, I'm ready to buy 10,000 items. And for a maximum of one dollar, I'm ready to buy 100,000 of them, okay? So you post some bids like this Ev on the chain, so everybody's transparent. You see the bids does by others, and what does the Dutch auction do? They compute the first price at which you can sell all the tokens for sale that day, right? Assume that that price is two dollars, I'm making it up, right? So when you say, uh, Umesh, you had uh, for a maximum of 10 bucks, you buy a thousand tokens. Here is a thousand tokens, it's your lucky day because the price is two. So you buy a thousand tokens by price of two. Wait a second, you also said that you wanted 10,000 tokens for a maximum price of five. Here is an additional 10,000 tokens for a price of two. You also said you want 100,000 tokens for a maximum price of one. Sorry, at the price of two, we sold them all. Right? That's, a, that's, a, um, uh, that's, a, that's what happened. So, Tokens are put in circulation periodically by Dutch auctions. Why Dutch auctions? Because assume that it, I, I tell you it's a fixed price, and I set up the price, and the price is two. You say, is this a fair price? It's a very fair question. If you say, well, we don't make the price, you do. Then uh, you cannot complain. It's a market-driven situation, right? And uh, so it's fair because you choose the price, and it's fair because uh, you see that uh, all the bids of everybody because nobody can, can stop them, and everybody realizes what the right price is. It's uh, way better. And the same mechanism, by the way, the foundation will do it for uh, auctioning off of the tokens, but you can actually use it for uh, auctioning off, say, a building, if you want to post a blockchain uh, building. Right? Because if you want to post a blockchain, an office uh, here in Berkeley, there is so much you know, st uh, startup, so much talent, you want to have uh, an office building to get all, all, all the startups, and you build it. If you Sell it locally, you have a local billionaires, real estate uh, investors who can pretty much will set the price for you. If you put them on the blockchain, you had billionaires from far away, but still very few. But if you allow to sell them fractional ownership via Dutch auction, you allow me from Boston to participate with a $10,000 bid to get a piece of your building. Then you really realize your, the value of the building. And I am very happy to have uh, the ability being far away to participate directly in something like this, right? So. Is there any step where you need a common source of randomness for a committee? So your committees are rotating. Actually, uh, no. You need uh, the fact that uh, inductive the blockchain is common knowledge, and, that, uh, and you have to be very, very careful on how you orchestrate this quantity QR. The analysis of quantity QR is. Uh, not, not for being a member of the ah, sorry. But no, no, shared no, point? except for the, no, 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 no. Only there is this random oracle, the hash function, and that's it. It doesn't, uh, so there's no coin flipping in the protocol that requires No, 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 because every time that you do a coin flipping in the protocol, you have to be very careful 
about our, um, it's very easy to flip coins when you have a fixed number of committee, because right, if you take a multi-party computation, right, I, I share uh, zero, you share one, you share uh, one, then we decrypt all of us uh, together, right? And then uh, you, you get uh, the sum model of two of these bits and there's a common bit. But now we have a fixed committee. So once you announce a committee, it can be attacked, it can be something. So we, we, do, we have a, a, a different way to approach the problem so that uh, uh, we shift you know, soundness and liveness differently so to make sure that the, you never have in Algorand a fixed committee in charge of anything, except for, for a secret committee speak only once. Okay, thank you, Silvio. Welcome. Okay.